First and foremost, I want to thank everybody for uh, appearing today and attending. The, I just want to get the exact title right. The ISBA Healthcare Law and uh, Young Lawyers Division uh, Professional Development Luncheon regarding a day in the life of an in-house healthcare attorney. My name is David Nyman. I'm an attorney at a law firm called Bazer Kolar. Um, ironically enough, my practice is plaintiff's personal injury law, and I thought it was kind of funny when we're having a uh, luncheon discussing health care law to have a plaintiff's personal injury attorney, but I assure you that it was a career change that I made halfway through when I was already planning this. I was in the defense world before that, but we have a great panel for you guys. First, I would like to introduce Leonard Nelson. He is the senior division counsel with the American Medical Association. Next to him is Katie Strzok. She's the Senior Associate General Counsel and Associate Vice President at Rush University Medical Center. Lastly, we have Jim Adamson. Hope I pronounced that right. He's the Director of Risk and Regulatory Matters at Satangra Health System. The gist of it, it's going to be a fairly informal session today. I'm going to allow all the <clears throat> members of the panel to speak briefly about themselves, who they are, uh, what they do, and how they got to where they are. And then we'll open it up uh, to everybody else for a, a quick uh, question and answer session. So. Without further ado, Jim. Or oh, I'm sorry, Leonard. <laughs> Do you want to start, Leonard? I apologize. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Well, hello again. Uh, Dave said thank you. Uh, my name is Leonard Nelson. I've been an attorney at the American Medical Association for a little over 18 years. Um, before I worked at the AMA, I was working for a small law firm, did a variety of uh, matters primarily litigation commercial litigation um, I uh, helped to bring a couple of lawsuits against physicians for medical malpractice before I uh, became an attorney at the AMA basically I knew zero health law um, and I found when I got there that is totally irrelevant um, that I knew just as much as I needed to know uh, uh, zero was a good place to start and what I do um, is a very unusual job. Um, I, I spend about half of my time as the director of the litigation center of the American Medical Association and the state medical societies. That's a coalition among the AMA and all of the state medical associations um, in which we, uh, primarily through my efforts, identify lawsuits that have a national impact on the medical profession. Sometimes we bring those lawsuits. Uh, most often, though, it involves amicus briefs. Um, uh, for example, there's a case that will come out in the next couple of months in the U.S. Supreme Court, Whole Woman's Health versus Eberstadt. We'll talk about the uh, constitutionality of a Texas law that restricts a woman's right to uh, have an abortion and the physician's right to care for those women. I think the U.S. Supreme Court will have a thing or two to say about our brief. Um, I spend Another 25% of my time is the prosecuting attorney for the AMA against members of the AMA or applicants for membership who are accused of violating the code of medical ethics. And uh, there's a council that determines whether those people should be fit for AMA membership and under what, what conditions. And the other 25% is more typical. I do certain transactional work, review contracts, um, respond to discovery requests, submitted to the AMA, um, and it's really pretty much what any corporate in-house attorney would do. So that's the general stuff. Hi. And is this actually on? OK. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I work at Rush. I've been in-house there for over eight years. And so um, I'm a little unusual in that I went straight from law school in-house. So um, that happened. I was out of school for a few years. I worked in government, I worked in politics, and then I was lobbying, and I decided to go back to law school. And I was always interested in healthcare law. So I took some classes in law school, um, and then I interned at Rush one summer. And it was the summer before my last year. And I didn't even apply or attempt to work there because there were, I think, eight attorneys, and they, one of them would have had to die, you know? And um, <laughs> So I just didn't think it was a possibility. And um, nobody died, um, luckily. But um, one of the attorneys, the one who I'd done most of my work for, he, uh, right when I kind of graduated, he um, threw out his back and he was out for a few months and he called to see if I'd be willing to fill in for him. And so long story short is they ended up creating a position for me and 
it's been a pretty incredible experience. I, um, the office has changed a lot, and I also had pretty much zero knowledge of healthcare law other than the classes I took in law school, one of which was reproductive technology in the law. So it's not like, although that it did eventually come in handy um, because Russia is the oldest IVF center in the city. It goes back to 1980. Um, that's a story for another day. So I would say, you know, what I do, my typical day has changed a lot over the last eight years. Initially, I was, you know, reviewing a lot of contracts and I was kind of named the in-house regulatory expert because the attorneys in the office um, didn't have any experience or expertise in those areas and weren't really all that interested in, in learning about it. And so, you know, I don't know, I'm, many of you probably know that that's mostly what healthcare law is now. So I just kind of, you know, said a prayer and hoped that I wasn't committing malpractice and I kind of went out and started um, uh, meeting with people throughout the medical center, specifically, you know, department chairs and administrators and the deans and educating them on the different requirements of Stark Law and getting a lot of arrangements into compliance. And, um, and then we had a change in our general counsel after a few years. And under the new general counsel, I assumed kind of more of a um, managerial role. So um, and hired a completely new group of attorneys. So there's only two of us left of the original eight or nine that I started with. Um, and so I got to hire a new team of attorneys and they're amazing. We try to find people that went to Loyola's healthcare program because they actually come out of law school knowing something about healthcare law, um, <laughs> which is amazing. And um, I would say I'm in a lot of meetings. Um, it kind of runs the gamut. So. I manage our office. We have about seven attorneys in our office and a couple paralegals. So I manage all of the transactional work. Um, I've kind of gotten away intentionally of reviewing contracts unless they're comp they, ha they in involve kind of complex regulatory issues. Um, but I manage that work. Um, one of our attorneys does all kind of our like corporate affiliation, merger work, so I oversee him. And then I oversee the regulatory work. So we have a couple attorneys who do that. And then I myself, um, I work with them. I'm the attorney for the medical staff, so I work with the medical staff. I work with um, quality, and these are things kind of that I've been able to throughout the years kind of push for because that's what's interesting to me. I like being a part of the actual um, care that the the institution's providing, and Rush is very mission based, and so I feel like I'm a part of something. Um, so, you know, I don't really have a, a typical day. Um, other than in the sense that I'm, I'm probably in a lot of different meetings and um, putting out a lot of different fires. Like, y I, have, I always have a list. We all do. We kind of joke about it. And it's very rare that I get to that list unless it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night and I'm at home on my computer. Um, one of the fun things, it can be frustrating, but it takes, I think, a certain personality to be in-house is you have to be very nimble. You have to be um, able to make, you know, quick judgment calls. You can't let perfection be the enemy of getting things done. Um, you don't have time to go and research something for 20 hours. So, um, so it's it's fun. It's exciting. It can be stressful, but um, I've, I think I've been really lucky. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim Adamson. Um, I'm with Centegra Health System. We're in McHenry County. Uh, we have currently two community-based hospitals, and we're building a third. Um, so we. Um, in my role, uh, because we're not an academic, large academic center, I wear a lot of hats. So um, I'm a 94 grad from Kent, and uh, most of my private practice was in uh, medical malpractice defense work with some regulatory thrown in there. And since I've been with Integra, I wear many hats uh, from contract review to regulatory compliance to medical malpractice defense and our claims management, as well as uh, managing our in-house risk management program. So. Um, I think the key, uh, for me at least, one of the things that I think is the most important element of being an attorney is th law school teaches you how to be a critical thinker. It teaches you how to solve problems in an analytic way, and it teaches you how to concisely communicate those answers to whoever is asking you the question. So those skills will follow you wherever you are, whether you're in private practice or whether you're in-house. And that's really what is, I think, the basis of being a good lawyer. 
uh, and it's what your client is looking for, whether your client is the corporation you work for or whether the client is um, you know, uh, someone who's hired you. Um, so those skills you have, and I encourage you to keep them and develop them because that's what will be your bread and butter is solving problems and communicating those answers appropriately. Um, you know, I always joked that, that in law school I wish they would have taught me golf and I wish they would have taught me how to be a salesman. Um, because to be a successful attorney, you often have to golf, right? Um, <laughs> but more importantly, you have to sell yourself. You are always selling yourself. Um, and you're selling yourself either to sell yourself to make rain as a private practitioner or you're selling yourself as a, with a skill set to develop, to be of value to uh, your client, whether that's in-house or out or outhouse. Um, so, um, you know, uh, a lot of times young lawyers don't realize that it's really about salesmanship. Um, if you can't get those clients, um, ultimately you probably won't be successful. And so different people have different talents in terms of selling. So you can sell your skills, um, and your, if your skills are like mine, where I think I'm pretty good at consensus building and comforting people and coming to resolution in a mediation kind of way as opposed to a regulatory or as opposed to a litigation way, um, I think those skills translate better to in-house, and that's why I made that move. Um, I'm still selling myself with those skills. Um, in private practice, you know, I could, I made a little rain, but my sales skills were not that great in that area. And so that's one of the reasons I transitioned from private practice to in-house. So I think, um, you know, the, the important thing to remember as in your career journey is um, anything's available to you. I think you follow what you enjoy doing and whether that's remaining in private practice or moving into the public, uh, public sector or moving in-house with a corporation. The skills that you developed in law school and developed during your career is what's going to set you apart um, from others. Because having that law degree and having those analytical skills really puts you up uh, above uh, peers uh, or competitors who may be trying to f assume a similar role but don't have that background. Um, just in terms of what I do on a daily basis, I, like, I'm all over the place. So, um, you know, I may be getting a call from the ED that there's a suicidal patient and they don't know what to do with because of XYZ presentation. Or I may get a call that uh, this contract has to be done tomorrow because our EMR has to be upgraded yesterday and it's a disaster. Unfortunately, they all do have to be done yesterday. Um, you know, I uh, may get a call that uh, CMS is at the door because they're doing an unannounced survey for provider-based billing compliance. So. One good thing about being in-house at, at a position like mine is that um, you got to know a lot of stuff, and it's interesting because it keeps you on your toes and you continue to learn. Um, and in private practice, you know, you end up you, you do similar things. Sometimes you can be specialized uh, more than others, but you're always learning. Um, so um, I've enjoyed the transition. I think it allows me to be more proactive than I was um, in private practice, being reactive. Um, and the good thing about being proactive is I think it gives you a better sense of accomplishment at the end of the day because you're really accomplishing something for your client who is the company you work for. So that's my spiel. I think we'll probably send it around for more commentary. Yes. Well, thank you very much for those introductions. Um, I'll open it up to the floor if you guys have well, any Let questions. me add one thing to what Jim just said. I certainly agree completely with what Jim said. But you know what? In this world, with more lawyers and there are law jobs, sometimes it's who you know and not just what you know. Build contacts. And I'm going to tell you a very good way to build contacts right now, and that is to join the Healthcare Section Council of the Illinois State Bar Association. And most of the people in that council are people that are, they've been around a lot of years. So you know what? If you come to a few meetings, you'll feel a little awkward. You'll say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? All these old people. What, what, what's going on? I mean, you know, Jim, Jim, well, but you know what? There is an opening there. We want new blood. We want people that are a few years out of law school. Do yourself a favor. Come to a few meetings. Accept that you may feel awkward. Accept that everybody knows everybody else and you feel out of place, but you will shine. And it's a chance to meet people, get new experiences, and learn new ideas. And, and I strongly recommend it. You can hold on to that. Um, also, I echo that sentiment with the Young Lawyers <laughs> Division. It's something that getting actively involved can only help in uh, a wide variety of ways. And also, another thing he said, building off that, even though you guys are going to refer to yourself as old, which I would disagree with, you guys are often the ones who are hiring. 
<laughs> so it could be in all young players' best interest to uh, attend those uh, activities or those events and get to know all the other lawyers regardless of age. Yes, we have a question? Oh, hi, Actually, let me... Uh, So you, you raised the question of hiring, and I know a lot of people in here are looking to be hired, or we know people who want to be hired by uh, institutions like yourselves or in-house counsels. What do you look for in hiring a young attorney? What, what are some of the uh, maybe classwork they've done or maybe some of the experience? What, what exactly are you looking for? Um, so I've recently hired quite a few attorneys, and it, it, it's not necessarily that I'm looking for the exact same thing for each attorney, but um, we I hired somebody, I, I felt like we really had a need with everything we were doing um, for somebody with some corporate experience, and so I, I got somebody at a major law firm with four years experience, kind of a sweet spot, because um, I do think that there are a lot of attorney, great attorneys who are at the big firms who aren't really quite sure that they want to go the partner route, so it's a nice time to kind of snatch them up. Same thing with a regulatory attorney who uh, was uh, in her third year at a big firm. And, um, you know, before they have the golden handcuffs and everything, uh, we brought her in. And, um, and then I've also, just because there is so much, I just, I've tried to, when I got into our office, people were mostly, the attorneys were mostly doing transactional work and contract review. So I've tried to take that and put it mostly into um, the hands of paralegals. Um, not all, it's not all that complicated, and when it is, then w one of the other attorneys will review it. And I've tried to move it more towards regulatory, employment, and like internal investigations, stuff like that. So I've actually hired um, somebody, two, two people recently, well, in the last couple of years, straight out of Loyola's healthcare program who had externed for us, so I knew that their work was really good, um, and they came in knowing quite a bit. And uh, quite frankly, I mean, the questions that we get on a day-to-day -day basis, you need somebody that can kind of quickly run over it and check it down. Um, and then also, I, um, I'm always looking for just, you know, like anybody else, the right fit. That we have a, a really um, collegial, fun office. We work hard. We play hard. We, have, we like to joke around. So you have to <laughs> have a good sense of humor. I mean, all those things. Because um, at the end of the day, you do have to laugh about a lot of this stuff. Um, but... You know, as far as, I, I think it really does depend on the position. So if I had an employment position open up, then I would be looking for somebody with that type of experience. Um, as well as somebody who I think would be good with the client. Because I think a lot of times people will be at law firms and they're not actually um, interacting um, in person with the client a lot. And I have to send people out in the medical center to meet with, you, I mean, C-suite, surgeon, I mean, just... And I need to feel confident that they're going to be able to um, communicate effectively and um, use those analytical skills and, and also just um, be providing, a s be more service oriented and not, um, you know, ooh, the lawyers are here, like, you know, here's the siren. Just we try to approach things as we are here to help and we're help you here to help you accomplish what you want to do and we're not here to like slap your hands and stuff like that. So. Um, I want to echo what Leonard said. Um, just in terms of main, uh, I, one of the best ways to get a position is to know someone who is looking to fill that position or know someone who is leaving that position and you can replace them. So um, cultivating the friends and contacts you made in law school, cultivating the friends and contacts you make who you're working with, even with your clients, um, it's critically important because um, building that relationship with someone is, is how they know that you're intelligent, personable, are good for a position. Um, it, it's not, and it's not LinkedIn connect. It's, l you know, it's personal connection with someone so that they know who you are and what your skill set is. Um, the, when I graduated, it was a horrible law market. I was law clerking for a law firm that did construction laws. And I, my first job was with, was in a construction law firm. And uh, it was okay, but it wasn't great. A buddy of mine from law school was at a firm doing med mal work. He transitioned to another role. There was an opening. That's how I got my entry into medical, malpra medical malpractice work. Um, next firm I went to, again, there was an opening there. Someone who I had worked with, a friend, got into the next firm. And so every, literally every career or every firm move that I have made 
it's because I have known someone who was leaving and suggested me to replace them. So it, it, my experience, I think, is typical for many, which is it's, it is, in fact, who you know. You also have to know what, um, but the who part is really important. Yeah, I should have said, so everybody that I've hired has either externed for me or was a referral through somebody I knew and trusted. So when we post our positions, we'll get like 100 resumes, and at the end of the day, I've always hired somebody that had, uh, somebody I know had sent me their resume. So there's a lot of truth to that. Not much I can add to, to that. Um, I don't do hiring for the AMA. When we do hire people, um, it's generally for people who do transactional work. So we look for people with skills in uh, analyzing contracts, not healthcare contracts, because th that's just, I mean, even though it's the American Medical Association, um, we're concerned with the general ability to analyze contracts. There are different aspects of the American Medical Association. Uh, Katie mentioned she used to do lobbying. There are, there's plenty of room for lobbyists. There's never enough room, but uh, you know there is room for <laughs> lobbyists at the American Medical Association, but they don't work in the Office of General Counsel Department. Um, they're sort of on the fringes of practicing law. So for young lawyers, just building off the question, it seems that everyone agrees it's not always what you know, but who you know. How do you put yourself into position to know the right people if you're a young lawyer, either in law school or early on in your practice? I think you'd go crazy if you said, I've got to put myself in the position to know the right people. I'm speaking for myself. I don't necessarily want to know the right people. I have to go through life feeling comfortable with the people I know. <laughs> but you've met people in law school, cultivate those relationships, uh, not, not obviously, not obnoxiously, not so you don't feel comfortable about it. but but. Katie got it right. I mean, you, you get a hundred resumes. Unfortunately, there's just too darn many lawyers. That's a shock to you. Um, and, and, and so what Katie says is, is true across the board. There's just so many resumes. What sets out one resume for, from another? Well, okay, this person was at the top of their class at Yale. Or okay, that, we got that. Um, but realistically, it's somebody I know, it's somebody that I've met, I can talk to this person or this person's friend, or this person's recommendation. And you know what? Those people tend to be the people that work out. Yeah. So it's not that you're gonna force it. You, I don't think you can force this, but you can push yourself a little bit. I told you about joining the healthcare section council. I absolutely mean it. Okay, maybe it's a little out of your comfort zone. It shouldn't be that much out of your comfort zone, or you wouldn't be here this morning. So, there you go. Um, I was just going to add one thing, um, which now has escaped me. <laughs> oh, cli uh, relationships. So, um, the, the relationships with your clients, um, especially when you're in private practice, are just as important as relationships with, uh, you know, law school friends, coworkers, whatever. Um, because if you want to make that transition to an in-house role, Oftentimes, it's because someone you've represented in the past knows you, is comfortable with you, and can tell you there's an opening here, there, or somewhere else, and that's a good entry point. <laughs> so, um, you know, developing those good relations relationships with your clients is critically important just for your attorney client relationship, but also on a personal level, developing that relationship can be advantageous to you as well. Oh, yeah, can you uh, pass the microphone over? Thank you. And following along those lines. Obviously, there are many different um, professional environments where the networking can take place in a meaningful way. For example, thoughts that come to my mind are the different county medical societies that have sections that talk about um, issues related to health care or hospital law, state uh, organizations, um, that focus on these these topics, in addition to the State Bar Association. City, Chicago, obviously, metropolitan um, entities and organizations of lawyers which have sections, committees, task forces, and things of that nature. And by putting yourself in a position to be around individuals who are working on different pieces and parts of healthcare 
problems or policies, etc. I'm sure that all of you have run into people who you might not have otherwise crossed paths with. And maybe you can elaborate on the value of the kind of thing that Leonard's talking about, but stretching it out a bit more in Illinois to those kinds of um, organizations, committees, entities, etc., where you have um, found uh, opportunity for networking and also uh, stimulation from an intellectual and legal standpoint. Um, I'll be really quick on this one because I don't like networking that much. So, and <laughs> that's one of the reasons why it's great for me to be in-house because I have so many people who need things from me and I don't have to go out and schmooze all the time. But, um, which also would make me a horrible candidate for uh, private practice. But um, I, in terms of networking and what I've seen to be effective, one thing, I don't like, I don't like going to lots of events and stuff and um, meeting new people. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not, I mean, just, you know, I, I'm not against meeting new people, but, you know, in doses. So, um, but one thing I've always done and continue to do, I actually have something next week, is if somebody I know sends me a resume and says, this person's really interested in healthcare law or whatever, being in house, I always go out to lunch with them, have a coffee with them, get to know them give them whatever advice I can I can and in one case it was somebody who I you know kind of kept in mind and uh, almost offered her position um, with Rush but I've also been able to connect those people in time when, when something comes up with positions and a couple of them have actually taken those positions so I really believe that you know you have to pay it forward you have to um, take the time to talk to you know your fellow attorneys and and help them in any way you can and so I I'm I'm perfectly happy to do those one-on-ones um, and I'll let uh, my esteemed co uh, speaker panelists uh, talk about networking <laughs> <laughs> um, well so any any area that you, you may be interested in whether it's from construction law to health to healthcare to aviation to products whatever they w they will have professional organizations of the people who are actually doing those things that you can participate in so um, I'll focus on healthcare because that's where I've been. Um, there are numerous areas from uh, the, the American Society for Healthcare Risk Management. There's a Chicago chapter of that. There's the Healthcare Compliance Association. There's a variety of professional organizations that cover healthcare topics. And um, you can, in fact, not only network and meet people there, but you can also learn things there that are beneficial for you uh, in your own practice and to transition to if you were to go in-house. Um, so. Um, for example, the Chicago Hospital CHARMS is the acronym. Um, there's a lot of lawyers in that group, but there's also a lot of regular healthcare people. Um, and it's a good forum to meet healthcare people, talk to them, learn, uh, learn what's important to them, um, and also learn things that are going on in the healthcare industry that you might not otherwise be aware of. Um, ASHRAM, that's the national level. They have a conference every year that's really good. Um, you know, it's a, it's a financial and time commitment to make it. Um, but it is a good networking opportunity to not only meet, to, to meet people on a national level that share your interests and um, frankly, from the networking piece, you know, maybe you don't want to stay in Chicago and would like to go to Florida or something where it's warmer, right? So you can meet people, um, you know, practicing in different areas and in different, in different uh, specialties by participating in those kind of uh, professional organizations. And I, I've certainly found it useful. I've met, um, you know, met a number of people through that process develop some friendships through that process as well so um, it's definitely something to take advantage of besides the legal stuff not that you shouldn't do it Leonard said but you should definitely follow up on those organ professional organizations that are in fields you're interested in let me just add, I just want to add one thing you know I don't think that this networking is just oh I'm doing this so I can get a job someday with somebody else I, I don't think that's really the key at all I think you're doing it partly so that you grow as an individual. Uh, and again, I, you know, I keep going back to the Illinois State Bar Association Health Care Council, but I know it, and, and I'm comfortable with it. And some of the people here are part of that organization. Those are colleagues. Those are people you can interact with. Those are peers. You have to feel comfortable in interacting with peers. You have to be comfortable in taking a position that may be uh, dis in disagreement with the majority of your peers and defending that position 
and th you'll grow as an individual. So it is absolutely not just about, oh, maybe I can hit this person up for a job someday. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but I do think you have to, um, you have to feel comfortable in what you're doing. And I do think um, joining associations, uh, meeting with peers, meeting with colleagues, discussing er issues of law with them, I do think is a way of individual growth. We have another question. Um, what, what would you say is the biggest challenge for somebody, uh, for argument's sake, and this is kind of a twofold question, for argument's sake, coming out of private practice for X amount of years and potentially an unrelated field um, in making the move, and, and also um, as far as the challenges in, in, in presenting oneself um, as a marketable candidate for a position? I, I think that's fairly easy, the easy one to answer. You got to find that opening. You got to find somebody. Y y you're, if you're in private practice and you say, "What I'm doing isn't an obvious connection to the next step," I'm sorry. You're going to have to have some sort of personal contact. It, it's just got to be. And you know, Katie, who's not a not a schmoozer, but still, she's the recipient of schmoozing. Y you'll know somebody who knows Katie. Okay, that's what you're going to do. Just because. Somebody will say, oh, I know this wonderful person at Rush, and there's an opening there, and I can, you know, she's a good friend of mine, and I can tell her that what a good lawyer you are because I've worked with you, or I've known you very well in various capacities, and I'll put in a word for her. You know what? you got a decent shot at it. But if you just, I'm sorry, I mean, you know, if you throw in the resume over the transom, yeah, you know, if you've got that Rhodes Scholarship, that's always going to be a plus. But if you're part of the 99 percenters, I'm sorry, you just, you, you've, you're going to have to know somebody who knows somebody and is willing to go to bat for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a ton to add to that. I think Leonard's right on. I mean, I, I generally don't spend a lot of time on resumes with a lot of experience in an area that I don't need, you know what I mean, that we don't have a need for. So um, at the same time, one of the attorneys I hired had, you know, zero healthcare experience, um, and I brought him in as a courtesy interview. And then, honestly, we just we got we liked him so much, and we kind of we were like, maybe if we hire him, the work will come, and it, it didn't end up happening. So thank God that happened. Um, but uh, I think that you, yeah, you need to ask the people that you know, um, who are either in positions or in offices that you'd like you'd see yourself in. Um, or who have friends who are there to um, make an introduction. And right now, I mean, we're not hiring, but when I meet with people, I know of a lot of things that are, a lot of places that are hiring. I'm on all the in-house listservs. Um, I have a lot of friends in the healthcare world. And so when I hear about stuff, I think about, you know, if I've met with somebody recently, I, I always think about that. And I send the resume so that I can make that introduction and that referral. I'll just add a, a slightly different bent to that. So a lot of in-house positions are not necessarily litigation focused because, you know, there's a wide variety of things that in-house counsel do that have nothing related to litigation. So let's say hypothetically your background is litigation. That gives you a, a large skill set that can easily translate into other areas. And so if you're in, if you want to go in healthcare, and let's say you've done healthcare litigation work, you and you get the entree, um, if you haven't done regulatory a lot, but you've done a little, um, and you haven't done commercial, a lot of commercial, but you've done a little, and you've got a litigation skill set, you know, that means you can think on your toes, that means you're analytical, it means you are, you know, can stand up to pressure. You can explain how those things will translate to your new role if this person will only give you a shot. And I think what you need to be able to do is articulate, these are all the great things I've done, these are all the great things I can do for you. It may be a different setting, but it still holds up. And that goes back to that, my original comments about just, you know, you've got a skill set already, just continue to cultivate it and you'll be able to sell yourself by explaining, this is what I can do, I know I can do this for you. It may not look like they're completely linked, but here's why they are. Just on the litigation, um, so we have an attorney who's amazing and he had zero healthcare experience he was a litigator he came in he'd been litigating for 10 years to manage our litigation so that's something that 
a lot of places, in-house places are looking for somebody to actually manage the litigation. And also, he has the experience to conduct internal investigations, which is also a very big part of um, being in-house. So I do think that that skill set is easily transferable. I'm not going to answer the question. We're going to make a point. <laughs> if you do get in a position, whether it's in-house, outside counsel, whatever it is, where you can help a fellow lawyer, you, each and every one of you, has a moral obligation to help that fellow lawyer. Uh, maybe you've been in that same position. Maybe next month you're going to be in that same position where you want a job, you, you're, you're looking, you're scrambling around a little bit. You, you, you pay into the system by, by helping the, the fellow lawyer. Don't just throw out that uh, request. Think about it a little bit. I understand. Katie gets 100 resumes. She said that. I use you as a whipping person. But, but I mean, that happens. All right, so there's some discretion involved, but you owe an obligation to help your fellow attorney. I'm sorry. Oh. Um, first, I'll echo what um, Leonard and Jim said. I'm actually new on the healthcare ISBA section this year, um, and it was out of my comfort zone to to go there. I didn't know anyone on the council, and I, in fact, I just met Jim today. So. Um, <laughs> And I uh, put the program together with Dave. So definitely everyone on the ISBA Healthcare Section Council is really nice and warm and welcoming. So um, you should come join us. Um, but my question <laughs> is actually about um, risk management um, because I know a lot of uh, hospitals have risk management departments. And I know a lot of attorneys that have taken positions in risk management fields in hospitals. And so I was wondering what the interplay is if you are an attorney that takes a position in risk management at a hospital, um, do you work with the general counsel's office and how do, could that transition into a position in the general counsel's office? But I'll just, yeah, I'll just say really quickly. So uh, the Office of Risk Management is under the general counsel at Roche. So um, it's a pretty big department. It's headed by an attorney and I think there's one attorney out of the eight employees in that. And we are actually currently hiring for a new chief risk officer um, at Rush. FYI. Um, so for, I, I think it's really helpful to have um, attorneys in risk because they can get the claim, the, the claims management side of things. Um, they have obviously very good analytical skills and they can also deal with a lot of the issues that come up with guardianship and stuff like that instead of having to call the attorneys. So you can, at least at Rush, you could be in the Office of Risk Management with, um, with a, you know, Associate General Counsel title. Um, I, a lot of healthcare systems do have risk under the general counsel. Um, they may have it under a quality leader as well. So it just kind of depends on the health system. There are a lot of attorneys who do risk management. Um, if you happen to have a clinical background and you're an attorney, you have a bar far better shot of getting into risk. Oftentimes, um, uh, risk positions, they want a clinical background. Um, you can overcome that by explaining that you have done health work in the past and you understand how it works and it's actually a benefit not to have a clinical background because you just ask a lot of questions. You don't assume anything. Uh, at least that's what I did. Um, so, um, I, I, again, I think that attorneys um, are, are well suited to be in risk management roles, whether it's an entry level or to lead a department. Again, not only because of their skill set, but because of how they're trained to communicate. I have been practicing law for 42 years. That sweet spot hasn't changed one inch in those 42 years. It's always two to four years, three to six years, something like that. <laughs> we don't want somebody who's just out of law school. They don't know nothing. They don't know where the courthouse is. They've never seen a contract. Oh, after six years, well, they want too much money. That's the sweet <laughs> spot. And getting in there can be tough. If you're just out of law school, how do you get there? I don't have an answer for that. I mean, obviously, if you can get 
get move into there, you're golden. But uh, getting there is not so easy. And also, if you um, have an interest in working in house, I would uh, highly recommend you try to get internships or externships or whatever in those places. Um, I mean, that's how a lot of the attorneys in my office were hired. And it also depends on the culture. And I, I think that uh, Rush used to have uh, the Office of General Counsel's culture used to be kind of um, a little bit older and um, certain type of, you know, transactional expertise. And now it's it's a pretty young um, group. And, I mean, I had to learn on the job. Nobody spent the time <laughs> to mentor me. Um, and so... I make sure that when I hire, I mean, I've hired a couple people out of law school, and I make sure when I hire them, well, first of all, they've done an externship, so I know they do good work, but I also know that they have the personalities where they can handle it, that they don't need their hand held. I mean, that's what you really want to portray and communicate, is that you're competent and that you are the type of person that's going to do everything you can and, and just go to your superior whenever, you know, you're going to have a very clear... Um, question, you've already done some analysis, you're not looking for somebody to kind of just, I don't know, hold your hand. Yeah? Because... Oh, did it turn off? That organization has three or four lawyers. Um, and uh, there, there are many, many not-for-profits, not necessarily state hospital systems. Um, Thank you. And not necessarily big hospital systems, which, you know, if you're following the news, they seem to be merging and merging into fewer and fewer. But uh, keep your eyes. There's... Um, I, I think it's, uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a website dedicated just to the not-for-profit world and new job openings. And you'd be uh, surprised how many lo lawyer positions are advertised on that. On that. So, so I know it's an, it's an area not many people think about. So thank you. The, o the only point that I wanted to add to that was um, when you're in private practice, you can get caught up in the billable hours and the churning of working and working. and. I think sometimes people get lost in that and five years goes by and they don't really think about am I enjoying what I'm doing and where do I, where do I w really want my career path to go? Because to Leonard's point, when there is that kind of sweet spot where you don't have enough experience and then you have too much. Um, and, and I think the too much argument is, is stupid. I mean, I, I don't see how you can have too much experience, but there are a lot of <laughs> employers. <laughs> well, that's true. But, um, you know, so there, so if you... I, I would just encourage to continually everyone to continually reassess if they like what they're doing and if they if they're if the path they're on is what they think they want to continue on because if you don't do that you're going to wake up one day and it may be too late to change your mind and especially if you do want to make that transition from you know private practice to in-house you want to have a goal in mind of how that's going to look and when it's going to happen looks like we have a few questions we can hand the microphone on. Um, yeah, I was just uh, respond. I, I, I've sort of reached that point, Jim. So, you know, I've done medical malpractice all my life and defense and then plaintiff, and I work alone. Uh, and I wish I had gotten into health law a few years ago. I kept thinking about it. But it seems to me for young lawyers, I, I, I would think it's hard to get a job without any health law experience. Now, that would be my thought. But it seems like if you, if you get, if you look at, you know, job openings these days, you know, health law is huge, right? But it says two to three years experience. Um, and I would just share with you, I, I knew a woman who worked at a firm defending a malpractice case, and she and, you know, and there were several lawyers, and uh, they ran into her court one day, and she had switched firms, and she now worked at a health law firm. She had gone to a conference and met some people, but even when I look at, uh, if I see two, three years experience, I'm assuming that they, 
the, the health law, the firm that has a health law department is looking for somebody who's got two or three years experience of health law. And that's really not the case, I don't think, oftentimes. They're just looking for somebody who's been a lawyer for two or three years, maybe worked at some other firm, knows the ins and outs of billing, those types of things. So, you know, I think if you just get a job at a firm, and then if you really want in-house, maybe you look for a health law private practice firm, you get a job there, and that, that seems to be at least a path into a hospital or in-house situation. Um, so that's all I've got to add. Thank you. I think it's too late for me. <laughs> I was hoping you might fill in the picture of health law practice generally. I mean, you've spoken on what the view is from in-house, and you've described an enormous variety of things that you might work on. But my very limited understanding of health law in private practice is that it's much more highly specialized. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, uh, does health law generally, as a, a field of law, consist of in-house counsels and their staff who do a lot of work, a lot of different areas of work, who then hire out if they've got a big med mal case that they need help on, they hire out for that, or a huge regulatory issue, they hire out for that. So if you could just complete the picture for me, I would appreciate it. Um, so we, yeah, we have, we use a number of outside counsel, and it depends. So you may, you know, we kind of do the day-to-day -day in our office, but um, the med mal has always been outsourced. I mean, somebody manages that, actually the chief risk officer manages that. But um, we don't do any of that in-house. So um, we, yeah, we use, we use attorneys who specialize in, we, I, there's an attorney that I use that specializes in HIPAA, attorney I use that specializes in fraud and abuse, attorney that has experience working um, on False Claims Act cases. There, I mean, so yeah, uh, antitrust. Um, and then complex healthcare transactions where you're entering into a joint venture with a physician group and buying property. And so there are people out there that are pretty specialized in those areas and you call on them when you need to, when it's uh, something that's a little bit more complicated and definitely can be pretty time consuming. Then you get into having to manage their, their billing. Yeah. I, I, I don't think anybody can s say I specialize in health, call, health law generally. It's yeah. too complicated. Um, you know, th and think about it. It's one sixth of the American economy, and it's a highly regulated aspect of the American economy, and it's a highly litigious aspect of the American economy. So, you know, it runs from drug companies get suing in gets getting sued in multi district class action lawsuits. Boy, do people those, a lot of lawyers make a lot of money in those sorts of things. Uh, you know, I mean, Katie mentioned False Claims Act cases, medical malpractice, which is what most people think about as health law. That's a sliver of health law. Uh, and then there's the transactional work. It's, it's an enormous amount of work. And in my judgment, it's completely filled with traps for the unwary. I mean, you know, what I would think of as, intu to me, intuitive uh, uh, contractual relationships, um, you have to be investigated because they may violate some anti-Stark, anti-kickback. I mean, they, they, they require a heavy amount of lawyering. N no one could possibly be, in antitrust law, no one could possibly be an expert in all of those areas. Uh, it's good to know a little about them, but other than that, um, you'd, you'd have to find a, you know, some aspect of it that you feel most comfortable with. There's so much. I mean, just uh, I, I have to rely on certain outside attorneys on like Medicare billing rules um, and uh, research compliance and those regs. I mean, there's just there's a lot of different niche areas. The only thing I would add is w so we're throwing out all sorts of buzzwords that you may not even be familiar with, right? So, just generally speaking, healthcare is like any other industry. I it can be hugely variable in what you need to know or understand. And health law, uh, health law runs the gamut from representing physician office practices and just how to run a business to getting them properly licensed to g giant pharmaceutical companies making sure their trials are being done correctly and making sure they're marketing correctly to representing hospitals and making sure that they're compliant with the myriad of regulations that are they're supposed to follow and just providing patient care let alone all the other regulations they're supposed to follow in billing let alone the insurance payer agreements they're supposed to be uh, compliant with and then all the other antitrust and 
So, I mean, it, any healthcare is such a huge range of stuff that if you're interested in um, regulatory work, contract work, commercial work, uh, professional liability work, you could find it in healthcare. Um, so it's kind of hard. I don't know if we answered your question, but it, it really does run the board. And I think um, depending on the healthcare company you're talking about, they will handle it in different ways about how much they do internally versus externally. Um, there's, you can only do so much internally typically. Um, for those really hot issues, you're going to need an external expert. I think we had one last question back. Did you still have? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand earlier. Well, I did have a question before, but uh, I, I'll just add something. I, I think this is a great panel. You guys are very, very on point. I mean, everything you've said makes sense. Some of us are about your age, so we kind of know that uh, it makes sense. But I, I, I will say one thing to some of the questions here today. If you want to meet other attorneys, most attorneys do want to help other attorneys, believe it or not. It may not seem so in court and litigation, but generally most attorneys will help another attorney. So I, I get approached all the time by young you know, students or young attorneys, and I'm more than happy to l hear about you, learn about you, and if I think I have a fit for you, I will do it just because it's the right thing to do. So Leonard hit it right on the mark. More attorneys than not will go out of their way to help you. So all you have to do is being here today and say hello to a few people here, give your cards and tell them what you're thinking about. I bet someone's going to be able to at least give you a, a, a contact or something. Okay? Well, I think I'm that's. Join oh. the health section of the <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? I'm sorry. Or would you like to make a comment? Question, comment. Um, <laughs> picking up on uh, what Mike said. Young attorneys, very young attorneys, um, often are attractive to regulatory agencies. So if you can get an opportunity to be with a regulatory agency, and you had that opportunity early in your career, then what happens is when you are at one time and for a short period of time a regulator you have a great deal of value when you transition to the regulated and a lot of advice that I've given to young attorneys are to look for those relatively low paying kind of thankless jobs um, could be at departments of public health it could be at the state level it could be at the county level uh, maybe even the federal level and be committed, subspecialize in some kind of regulatory undertaking so that you get that down. And then when you can say, and you can walk out of that to a hospital or to a law firm that I spent two years regulating X, not six, two. <laughs> um, then you're in a position for that hospital to say, well, we need somebody who's on top of that. Um, you're perfect for us. And I, I'd like some reaction from the panel about, about I mean, that. I mean, that you can write your so highly coveted by so many different people to have experience working um, in government or with one of the uh, agents, regulatory agencies, it's, um, you know, you're going to get scooped up pretty fast and you're probably going to go wherever the, wherever the heck you want, whether it's in-house or private practice. Um, those are some pretty serious credentials. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had done it. Let's <laughs> <laughs> take a major pick up. <laughs> All right, well. It's a little bit after 1 o'clock. I think uh, we've gone past our time. Thank you very much for attending. It was a terrific uh, session. I'd like to thank our panel.